Hello everyone and welcome to the March 2024 edition of Fiction Fix Online. We are live streaming this event to The Finger on the Pulse, which is the Facebook group for Fiction Fix Online and the Zoom video will be posted afterwards, usually up to a couple of days later, depending on the circumstances, on my Helen Claire Gould uh, channel on YouTube. So please do subscribe and please point all your friends to it. Um, <clears throat> If you wish to join the finger on the pulse, please ask to do so or message me on Facebook for an invitation. This obviously doesn't apply to the people I'm talking to here, but if anybody is watching this or watches this later and wishes to join, just get in touch and we'll, we'll sort it out. There are a few rules to review and some questions to answer, but the group is both for readers and listeners. At our Fiction Fix Live events, we used to have a books table, but that was in the pub, and we can't do that with Fiction Fix Online. So for our authors, if you are reading this afternoon, please post your book details in the chat and include your website along with a link to the book and the seller or sellers for the print version. Uh, prices would be helpful and an ISBN or a SIN if you have it. Uh, on Amazon Kindle, the link should take readers straight to the book. And this can be done at the end or at any time during the show while you're not reading. And I will post the details with the live stream and the video or in the comments below it as appropriate. Depends where I can slot it in really, depending on where I post it. So if you hear something that you really like, do please use the reactions, which are down the bottom here. To oh, wrong one. Uh, to um, put up a heart or um, clap or uh, there's another one you can do. Put your thumbs up. <laughs> uh, so you could do that, and um, <laughs> that's that's fine, and that would be very encouraging for people who are reading. I think so. Um, yeah. So, um, does everybody know where that is? I think they, they do. You do, don't you? So four of our readers today are returning guests and we have one newbie. Uh, so all of our readers today are based in the UK, but sometimes we have people from America um, and we're, we're happy to have anybody from anywhere, really. <laughs> um, so please unmute everybody as we join our first author. Now, Steve Murray, Steve hasn't arrived yet. Uh, we don't know what's happening with him. There's something in the chat. Uh, yeah, no, that's all right. That's all right. What's you going? Yeah, that was you. <laughs> okay, that's fine. So, um, yeah, so please unmute everybody as we join our first author which Marie's you've moved up that you bumped we bumped you up the table yeah, <laughs> do you mind going first no I don't mind that's great okay so um will you um uh please um put your hands to work and uh, welcome Marie's Morland reading from her latest novel Time and Elvira Jones thank you all so much for uh muting yourselves during the reading okay Take it away, Maurice. Okay, right. So the, the story so far, um, Paris Everson, time technician grade three, is on the run from some really bad people. He accidentally sends himself too far into the past and ends up in present day Hampstead. Elvira Jones, particle physicist, takes him in and together they look for some way of contacting the future authorities. Paris is continually worried that the criminals will find him. And one day when he's alone in Alvira's flat, the inevitable happens. And I should also mention that synapsin is a truce drug. Oh, good one. Thank you for that. Uh, Paris, in a tussle with the laptop's idiosyncrasies, was suddenly aware of a cold draft eddying past him. He knew its signature only too well. The 26th century receptor field, 
He had enough presence of mind to slam the laptop shut before turning toward the newcomer, a woman with cold amusement in her eyes, standing in the middle of Elvira's living room. Paris had last encountered that mocking gaze in the lower levels of the Institute, just before he had fled into the past. You've given us quite a runaround, Paris Everson, she remarked. How did you find me? He asked wearily. Your shoes, came the knowing reply. Zugon hide, highly re regarded and subject to counterfeit. It carries synthetic DNA markers where farmed, place of manufacture, vendor, batch number. Not that we needed all that detail. There's no other alien DNA on Earth. Not in 2023, anyway. The synapsin gun was in her hand. Please, said Paris, not that. You know what I discovered and why I ran. You don't need anything else from me. Actually, I do, she contradicted. You interest me, Paris. By the way, my name's Despina. I'll permit you to cry it aloud later. Why would I do that? She didn't answer immediately. Do you realize, she said, when we cornered you in the tunnels, you were staring at me for two whole minutes. We could have overwhelmed you. Norvis could have beaten you insensible. Then why didn't he? I ordered him not to. You see, I know why you stared. From fear and desire. Yes, desire. Did the frisson of fear arouse you, or did you want to enjoy a bad girl? Or were you half in love with easeful death? He recognised the quotation. He was surprised she knew it. You thought I was street. How crass of you. We'll need to put that right. With Norvis's help? I'll manage. I've sent him on a little errand, which will give us time for a catch-up. Judging by the decor, this is an all-female household. Your clothes are new and contemporary. In short, you're a kept man. According to the pattern of life profiling for this decade, your benefactresses probably think you're exceptionally polite, modest, appealing, but inexperienced. Did you make the standard offer of sexual services for your keep? What difference does it make? He asked, increasingly confused. She waved the gun. Answer the question. Yes, I offered. Both women declined. I'm doing housework instead. So you didn't mention how your fancy finishing school gets its results. She came close to him and drew a teasing finger along his mouth. What a naughty boy. Lies by omission. May I quote from your school prospectus? There is nothing more disappointing for a bride on her wedding night than a confrontation with a nervous and inept bridegroom. We guarantee that all our graduates are thoroughly coached in the performance of their marital duties. I also have reports from three of your ex-tutors. They're meant to be confidential. Dora, who says you displayed energy and enthusiasm. Betty, who praises your sensitivity and solicitude. And Lainey, enough, please. And Lainey, who simply writes, Paris gives good head. I'm not altogether sure what that means. How to explain? The front door abruptly crashed open and the vets call, called out, um, hey, Paris, I've got your shoe. Some weirdo outside the shop followed me and I had to pepper spray him. Paris, who's she? What the hell's going on? Paris made a grab for the synapsin launcher. Run, Viv, he yelled. She ran. Back to her car, the shoe was still in her hand. Then she drove frantically to Coherence Co, cursing the afternoon motorists and skidding to a halt at the barrier. Max, Max! He peered cautiously out. Where's the fire? It's Viv, Max, Elvira's flatmate. You have to get her up here right now. There's a hostage situation at the flat. Please hurry, tell her it's about Paris. She'll know what I mean. Max made the call, appearing to dawdle. Then his attitude swiftly changed. She understands. She's on her way up. She said, no police. Of course not. She can deal with it. I do believe he can. She can, said Max. She's going to be at least another five minutes, though. Those elevators take the time. I'll move my car. 
They've had backed it away from the exit. Come on, Vera. Come on. The lift from the south, the sub basement, took six minutes. Oh, Vera managed to ask Vivek just one quick question as Max raised the, bar raised the barrier. Who's with Paris? I think it's that woman, the one he talked about. She was wearing a gold metallic mini skirt, long boots, and Viv, and she had a gun. Right, you stay here. Stay here, Viv, I mean it. Paris's clumsy attempt to seize the snaps and gun had failed miserably. The canister had ruptured, shedding its icy contents on his face, neck, and hands. Unable to keep his balance, he was currently on his knees before Despina. You damn fool, she said, almost fondly, and ruffled his hair as he leant drunkenly against her. You've overdosed. You've absorbed enough to subdue six people. Stay still. You need the antidote. It's all true. What is? What my tutors said. I promise you the best sex ever if you agree to let me live. Parius, Parius, if I thought you could deliver, I might be tempted, but synapsin depresses the system, so at the moment you have nothing to bargain with. A tiny inhaler appeared in her hand. Before I administer this, you need to tell me about Edwin Jensen. You claim to have studied with him, but he was never on the Academy roster. What was the real reason for your visit to Jennifer? You know the reason. Camille's Commis commiseration. Paris was doing his best to slide to the floor. Edwin wasn't at the finishing academy. He was at, with me at TTI's training college for time technicians. Despina swore under her breath. How could her handlers have got the facts so skewed? Are you going to kill me now? Paris asked, smiling hazily. I'll save you for later. Despina touched a communicator patch on her inner wrist. Norvis, respond. Target is clean. I repeat, target is clean. Find the women and rendezvous with me now. Then to Paris, here, take the inhaler, breathe in, deep breaths, just breathe. Get away from him. Suddenly, Alvira was there, seizing Despina and hauling her across the room. Paris crawled aside, found a table leg to lean against, and watched beatifically as the two women fought. Thank you. Ooh. Right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Right. Can you please unmute everybody and give Marie's a really lovely round of applause? Right. OK, so Steve is with us, which is great. Steve, um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, uh, that's great. I'm really sorry great. for the late arrival. It's been no worries. absolute farce. No so, worries. I, I'm no. here now. I'm willing oh. to take the last place so everybody else can do their... All right, okay. We'll come back first. to you. Well, I, you can come on before me, can you? Yeah, that's fine. Yes, that's before fine. Because I always go last. Cause I have to yeah, sure. Do yeah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Hi, David. Right. It's, been a it's been a while. <laughs> right. Okay. So, uh, so have you got a publication date for this yet, Marise? Uh, no, not yet. Oh, you're still waiting to hear. I'm. I'm. So, I'm still. I haven't finished it. Oh, right. Oh, work in progress. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I thought um, from the way you were talking that it was kind of you were waiting to have a publication date that's okay that's, that's fine i've um, done some new new stuff for the beginning that's the bit i was reading is up to about thirty two thousand words uh and it will see great into something i've already written so there's just a gap oh. in the middle so oh okay it didn't take me too long no. uh, and uh, b before that I, I should have some um fiction for all anthologies coming out with me in them Fabulous. I haven't, uh, they've accepted three, at least three, but uh, I haven't heard from them about that either. Oh, right. Well, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, um, yeah. Um, so please show your appreciation for Marie's anyway, and hopefully she'll get some communications soon. 
Okay, so um, everybody will shifty up for a bit and then Steve will come in just before me. Okay, so our next guest reader is Debbie and she is going to be reading from, I believe, uh, the latest novel in her Long Ears series. That is right, isn't it, Debbie? Long Ears yes. Legacy. Long Ears Legacy, right. Okay. Um, I believe it's yet to be published as well. Yeah, I'm working, I'm currently working on the penultimate chapter. Whoa! So it's <laughs> taken me a long time to, uh, to get there, but I'm there. Well, I have to tell you, I'm so delighted to see you here again, Debbie. Thank um, you. Anyway, will you please mute yourselves during the reading? But before you do that, please make some noise for Debbie Daly reading an extract from The Shield of Elpha. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is um, an excerpt from chapter two. Um, I should just perhaps give a little bit of background. Lizzie Longton is a half elf. Um, she's um, a young girl. She's got a group of friends and they're currently in Elfdom in the mystic world. And um, she has a particular friend who is a, a silver dragon, a rare silver dragon. He's a juvenile and he's gone missing. And so her and her friends are making their way back to Eldragonia, which is where the dragons are kept in the mountains of snow. And um, in the meantime, her arch nemesis, Duke Heldorth, is making his way through Elfdom to find the errant witch militia. Chapter two, our enemies in the north. The bar of the Goblin's Goblet was not a place that a respectable resident of Elfdom would want to be found dead in. And if they were a respectable resident, that's probably just how they would be found if they had the misfortune of stumbling upon it by accident. As Duke Eldorth entered, the noise of the patrons arguing and shouting their discourse with each other jarred on his tired nerves. He had ridden long and hard from Elverpool to Eldenborough, so as, so as to reach the inn before nightfall on the second day of his journey north. His little cob horse with its short stumpy legs jogging him along had made for an uncomfortable ride. More than once he had wished that he had ridden his usual mount, the magnificent coal black stallion, Colby, but his beautiful horse would have drawn too many interested eyes and Eldorth had wanted to remain incognito. The overwhelming stench of sweat and unwashed bodies mingled with the smell of the beers and liquors that were being served in the bar almost caused Eldorth to retch from its assault on his nostrils. Like all elves, he had heightened senses and so any smell, noise or taste was much more intense than they would be to humans. What was it with these places, he thought? Do none of the people who frequent them know what soap is? Eldorth was most fastidious about his ablutions and personal hygiene. If he had any other choice, he would have turned and walked straight back out again. But if he was to find out the information he wanted, he would have to suffer it for now at least. Eldorth withdrew a handkerchief imbued with perfume from his pocket and held it to his nose. He made his way to the bar, making sure that he avoided contact with any of the other occupants of the room. He was followed closely behind by his two Yob companions, Yart and Yonk. Their bulk and threatening presence a deterrent to anyone thinking of approaching the trio. The innkeeper was occupied filling a tankard with frothy topped beer from a large pull tap on the bar top while chatting animatedly with a customer. Eldorth eyed him impatiently. He hated waiting at the best of times and was unused to it, but right now he was tired and more than just a little irritable, even for him. Eldorth watched the exchange between the customer and the innkeeper, who seemed to be in no hurry to serve his new patron. With his glare fixed upon the innkeeper, Eldorth's anger and impatience grew and his eyes and lips narrowed with each passing moment. The innkeeper suddenly started feeling very hot under his collar and, and the said collar seemed to be getting tighter around his neck. He placed a finger in it to try and loosen the constriction. Beads of sweat broke out on his thinning pate and his round face with his sagging jowls turned a bright shade of crimson. The customer he'd been talking at to stared at him in alarm. Are you all right, Elgus? 
With an increasing sense of panic, the innkeeper's watery eyes scanned the room and finally alighted upon Eldor. A sneer spread across Eldorth's features as he watched the innkeeper's face register the realisation that Eldorth was responsible for, his, for causing his discomfort. Eldorth felt the same smug satisfaction he had when he had caused a similar effect on the leader of the Red Demon Gang back in Elverpool. The innkeeper took a sharp intake of breath and swallowed hard as his collar seemed to loosen about his neck and he could breathe more easily. He took the grubby cloth that he used for wiping the glasses out of the greying apron around his rotund waist and mopped his sweating brow before making his way over to Eldorth. He had witnessed a similar mind control spell by someone on a feral elf in his bar some weeks previously. On that occasion, the culprit had been a beautiful raven-haired woman who, never, who nevertheless had a malevolent aura about her. This new stranger by the looks of him could be her brother. The innkeeper was used to having the dregs of the mystic world inhabitants, world's inhabitants in his bar, but this individual and the woman before him were something else. He was perfectly happy to step in and break up a, bra a bar brawl or eject a drunken lout, but the quiet malevolence that emanated from the dark-haired stranger and the woman he had previously had the misfortune to encounter gave him the heebie-jeebies. I see that I finally have your attention, Eldorth said smoothly as the innkeeper reached him. And what can I do for you this evening, sir? The innkeeper asked politely, trying to keep the conversation light while eyeing Eldorth warily. He didn't want to antagonise the new arrival further and thought it best to keep a calm exterior even if his insides had taken quite a shaking. A drunken, goblin-type preacher sitting on a stool just along the bar suddenly called out. Oi, oi, I was before him, it complained, it complained loudly. Eldorth slowly turned towards it and cast his venomous stare on the creature, almost causing it to topple from its perch. Such was the intensity. As I said, sir, what can I get you? The innkeeper reiterated, flashing the drunk along the bar, a warning look. Writing itself, the drunk held up its four-fingered hand in submission and said, That's all right, I can wait. It turned away quickly and began staring at the beer-stained bar top in front of it, too frightened to even flick a glance along at the sinister stranger now being served. This pub's getting scarier than ever, it thought to itself. Eldorth looked at the bottles and flasks lining the shelves and decided upon an oak-aged liquor, its amber colour glowing in the flickering lights of the bar. A shot of your best whisky, innkeeper, and these two will have a, ta will have a tankard of ale apiece. Eldorth said smoothly, indicating the two yobs standing just behind him. Eldorth then leant across the bar, being careful not to allow his clothes to touch the beer-splattered top, and continued conspiratorially, and some information. The innkeeper turned, and taking a bottle from one of the higher shelves, poured a shot of whisky into a small glass and passed it to Eldorth before pulling two tankards of ale and giving them to Yart and Yonk. And what information is it that you are requiring, sir? The innkeeper said more genially than he felt. Eldorth took a sip of the fiery liquor and almost coughed as it hit the back of his throat. He was unused to whiskey and decided he didn't much like it. But when in Caledonia, do as the, Cal as the locals do and drink their national beverage. I'm looking for a woman, Eldorth said. Aren't we all? The innkeeper quipped winking suggestively, trying to lighten the mood, but failing miserably. Eldorth regarded him icily, but ignored the innuendo. Perhaps I should be more specific. I'm seeking a witch. She's small, rather dumpy and dishevelled, with wispy brown hair and a blotchy complexion. She's also quick-tempered and malicious. The innkeeper looked nonplussed. This woman wouldn't be anyone's type by the sounds of her, but especially this noble-looking individual. Oh, well, he thought. It took all sorts. Sorry, but I don't recall anyone of that description being here. We don't attract many witches, as they tend to go to the Warlock Coven Bar in Cauldron Row. I can give you directions there, if you like, the innkeeper said quickly, hoping to get rid of the stranger. No need. We've already been there, said, Elwood, said Eldorth, sighing impatiently. 
I know that she came to the city and must have stayed somewhere. The bartender at the Warlock Coven said that you have rooms for the night, and as you're tucked away here in the depths of the city's back alleys, it's just the sort of place she'd head to. Well, I'm sorry I can't be more helpful, apologised the innkeeper, and turned to walk away. But before he could take another step, Eldor stopped him. Just a minute. My companions and I... My companions here and I need accommodation for the night, so I'll have your best room for me and these two can bunk down where you can fit them in, Eldorth demanded. The innkeeper really wanted to refuse this stranger the room, but he was afraid that it might be worse for him if to do so. Plus, the money would come in more than welcome. So instead, he said, of course, sir, I'll arrange to get the room ready for you and hurried away to instruct his wife to go and turf out the current occupant of his best room and prepare it for the new arrival. Thank you. Right, could you please unmute and show your appreciation? <laughs> That's only half the chapter, but you get the gist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was actually really well read, uh, Debbie. I, I, I really thought that, that, you know, it sounded great. Thank you. Hmm. So, um, right. Um, it's this one is not finished. You said no. It's um, I'm on the. I've, I think two chapters left. Really, um, I've planned out two chapters, and I'm on the penultimate one at the moment. The rest of the book, um, about half of it has been proofed. Uh, I've got people proof that proof it. My daughter, who's English is far far better than mine, has been doing a final read over, um, but. So about still got about half the book to be proved. So okay, I'm, I'm planning um, to be having it available by. Well, I'm hoping. Fingers crossed. I'm getting people contacting me and saying, "When is it coming out?" <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm hoping to. I'm aiming to sometime sort of summertime, but it's getting a cover for it as well because um, yeah, I've, I've, I've you've, you've told me with, about that. Yeah, I've lost contact with my illustrator, so yeah. I'm just going to have to think about that. Yeah. Um, so you've got several other books in that series. I have. Do you want to tell us what the titles are, because you should, you know, if anybody uh, is is thinking about reading this series or reading this yeah. book, there are th three books, I think, that you there's should three, read first. three earlier books. Um, yeah. There's The Harp of Elvis, um, The uh, Dragonflyers, and the light knights, as in knights uh, in armor, not knights as in day and night. <laughs> um, and um, they're, they're aimed really, well, well, I wrote them for sort of seven to 12 year olds, but I've got readers, my oldest reader that I know is 97. <laughs> and, oh, <bless. laughs> they, they sort of see, I seem to have a broader appeal than I anticipated. Yeah. But um, yeah, they um, so far touch wood. They they've gone yeah. down quite well. So, but I'll put all the details in the in, in the chat. The chat. Um, yeah. I haven't put the links, but mm -hmm. basically they are on Amazon and they're on Kindle and in paperback. You can so. find them fairly easily. So if you search me, I do I do come up as um, if you search me. Yep. So I'll put that in. The, I'll put that all in the as I said in the chat. Yeah, fantastic. Okay. So um, let your hands do the talking for Debbie. And it's Debbie Daly and the Shield of Elpha. Am I saying that properly? Yes, you are. You are saying oh, All right, it. fabulous. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Now, we're going to welcome now our newest reader, Dave, with his latest science fiction offering, uh, so let's have a warm Fiction Fix welcome for David Cartwright with Riding the E-Rail. Thank you very much. And many thanks for to everybody for muting yourselves during the reading. Oh. Okay, um, yes, this is uh, the start of the book, which is not released out, but not released yet, but will be coming out soon. So we're starting right at the beginning with chapter one. Is that a... As the conversation got louder, I started to hear pieces of it from across the bar. It cut through the shitty electronic music playing in this shitty bar on this shitty space station out in the back end of nowhere. Or maybe not the back end. At least it wasn't the outer rim. The speakers were raising their voices again. They wanted someone to hear. Nah, can't be. One of them wouldn't come in here. 
The voice was dull with a flat quality that told me it was being translated by my interpreter implant, but jeez, for once I hoped that they weren't talking about me. I'm telling you, it is. Chairs scraped and I hung my head over my piss-poor beer and sighed. This is how it starts, in a hundred bars on a hundred worlds, and it never, ever ends well. It's a damn human. There it was. Those four stupid words that I could never escape from. A glance in the mirror mounted behind the bar, because nearly every bar in the way has one, it's like galactic lore or something, showed three of them coming my way. Crap. I couldn't quite place the species. They were taller than me, broader too, and had big black compound eyes in their fleshy orange faces, like terracotta, only sweatier. Each one had a set of jowly, mucus-coated gills along their cheeks and rubbery mouths that trembled and dripped as they spoke. I didn't fancy the prospect of punching one of these chuckle fucks because the splashback might drown me. They stumped across the room, clustering behind me until I could smell the acrid stench of their sweat and, as much as I could tell, glared at me with multifaceted insectoid eyes. Pushing my drink aside, I put on my dumbest, widest grin and turned around. I'm sorry, you're mistaken, I announced loudly and cheerfully. I'm Farsian. Humans have smoother features and their hair doesn't grow down to their ears like mine. Honest mistake, it happens all the time. I lied, cheerfully, waving them off with all the good nature I could fake. It was a weak card for a dumb mark. It didn't work often, but in a pinch it was all I had. You can't afford pride when you're a human in this galaxy. The leader, a big jelly-faced lug, leaned in toward me and favoured me with a fleshy sneer. Well now, ain't you out in the wrong arm of the way? The creature's friends exchanged looks behind it. Like I said, I'm not sure what species they were, and reading expressions on other scents, galactic slang for sentient being, is hard enough when their face doesn't look like retrograde reproductive organs, but I got the feeling they weren't convinced. You know what they say, I put on my most sincere small system hick act. It's a big verse. I decided to come out and see it, maybe make my fortune. From the look of these things, their loose coveralls, grease stains and ident tags, they worked in either station maintenance or maybe the import-export yards. Hopefully the assholes were as dumb as I was playing at being. Taking a breath, I went for broke. I didn't know there were any humans left anymore. Are you kidding? One of the others chuckled, a nasty wet noise that made its jowls quiver. That species is harder to kill than a Jaskari roach. I let that slide. I've been compared to worse things than that particularly hardy species of vermin before. Maybe. The one in my face really sneered this time, malicious delight dripping from its saggy jowls, alongside what I hoped was just excessive saliva. Can't be more than a few hundred thousand left. They're riding the E-Rail, and that's for sure. The E-Rail. The Extinction Trail. A term coined by humans back in the days of the Empire, a label for any species inevitably circling the drain of existence. A great galactic joke that it was us on the rail now, although I guess we did our best to deserve it. They laughed over that, and, like a good little stooge, I joined in too. The leader clapped a pudgy three-fingered hand on my shoulder. It leaned in real close so I could smell the beer and burnt rubber stink of its breath. If you want to know something, bub, it said jovially, and I really should have guessed what was coming. You can't lie to a Chiraxian human, it hissed in my ear as its hand gripped my shoulder harder and it drove a fleshy fist into my gut. God damn Chiraxians. Walking lie detectors, every one of them, I remembered as I folded around the punch and dropped from my stool, colliding heavily with one of the sweaty jackasses on the way down. Whether it was something to do with pheromones or a low-level empathic ability didn't matter much to me as I hit the deck. The plating was sticky and smelled of stale beer as they started kicking me. Two absolutes in this galaxy. One, at some point in their history, every sentient species has created some form of liquid intoxicants. I mean, humans can't lay claim to that particular innovation. 
and two, wherever it is imbibed recreationally, every drunk ass scent spills. Now, I might not have been able to identify them, but I knew for sure what each of them was wearing. GC belts. Gravitational compensation harnesses, if you want the full name. They cushion a species' organs as they adjust to a higher gravity level. Big as these things were, they were definitely from a low-G world. Their muscles and bones weren't as dense as mine, and when I curled up to take my licks, it was like being wailed on by kids wearing boxing gloves. I'd be sore, but I'd survive. I always did. So why the charade? Why not fight back? It's like I said, it doesn't pay to be proud when you're human. A human getting worked over in a bar was unlikely to draw the attention of the authorities. Hell, they might even wade in themselves, depending on the system. But any human laying it down on some regulars in a bar is asking to spend a few uncomfortable nights in a cell while those same uncaring authorities drag through the unsolved files for a few extra things to pin on them. Anyway, the benefits of having low-G aliens kick your ass on a standard G space station? They can't hit too hard and they get tired real quick. So, puffing, blowing, and chuckling, my three assailants went back to their table to vi finish their drinks noisily before they headed out the door, congratulating each other loudly. I didn't feel too bad about it. As I'd fallen against it, I'd lifted one of the chump's credit chips, so at least I wasn't paying for my drinks tonight. Once my playmates had left, I hauled myself back onto the stool, grateful that at least they hadn't poured my drink over me this time. I sat down with a huff and checked the damage in the mirror. Luckily, they hadn't bloodied me up too bad. My shirt and jacket were a little creased up, or a little more creased up, I should say. That and a few aches was about the sum of it. I picked up my glass, swilling the amber liquid around thoughtfully. You know what I love about this place? I declared, gesturing around at the dull grey polyalloy walls with their old stains and faded ad displays. It's the way the staff really looks out for their clientele, right, Clive? Clive, the bartender, stood, impassively polishing a glass. Another universal standard seems to be the saloon bar. It's a simple idea, and I'm pretty sure we didn't invent these either. But wherever you go, whatever the physiology of the customers or the atmosphere of the planet, there will be dives like this where any scent with a few credits to spare can get shit-faced and air their woes to indifferent serving staff. Humans don't have a mon monopoly on sarcasm, you know, he grunted, and I knew Clive was a he. He'd gone to pains to make it clear. His voice was deep and harsh, even through the muted tones of the translator. Clive was a bovis, big, strong, possibly intelligent, vaguely resembling a minotaur from old Earth legend. His name wasn't really Clive, but the one time I tried to pronounce his actual name myself, I ended up proposing to some furry little bastard that we engage in the kind of sexual act that's frowned upon on most worlds, and illegal on several more. Needless to say, he really took offence. The wonders of modern trans translation implants, am I right? Or at least, implants sold to a human who got conned at the cybernetics clinic because local security wasn't going to do a thing to help them, even if they filed a complaint. Honestly, I was too young and too dumb when I got it to know that the tech was going to switch out for a cheaper model and pocket the difference because I was human. The thing mostly works, but sometimes it gives me images and sensations instead of words, mostly for names, and leaves me to try and replicate the pronunciation myself. I brushed at a stain on my shirt. You might want to clean the deck sometime. Why? He shrugged his, whole sh his huge shoulders. You got off it. Taking a drink, I shook my head. I don't know why you treat me so badly, I sighed, holding up a digit. I'm in here all the time. It's the only bar on the station that doesn't throw you out, he growled. I counted another point off on my fingers. I always pay for my drinks. Because I won't let you run a tab, he countered. And, I held up a third finger, I don't start fights, I finished. Putting down the glass, he grinned nastily. But you always cause them. He picked up another tumbler, polishing industriously. You're lucky I let you drink here at all. Frowning to himself, he raised his head, sparing a more appraising glance. What are you all gussied up for, anyway? He grunted. I mean, you still look like shit, but there's some definite polish to the turd there. 
I finished my beer in a long gulp and tapped the glass on the bar. Five must have been bored to actually show an interest, but the lunch rush had thinned out and the various customers were walking, shuffling or sliding back to work. I have a job interview, I replied smugly. Well, you don't seem in any rush to leave. His brow furrowed in confusion before he started so suddenly that he almost dropped the glass he was filling for me. You're not meeting them here, are you? I nodded. You are meeting them here, he chortled, a deep bang sound. You must want to seem desperate. I know what I'm doing, I grinned. Thank you. Okay, if you could please uh, unmute and please make some noise again for David Cartwright and riding the e-rail. Thanks, Dave. That was really well read. Fantastic. So um, now I met our next guest reader a very long time ago. And so he's probably worked out that he's going to be next. Um, it, this was when we were in the same orbiter together. And over the last few years, he's been publishing his work, some of which is in the, uh, some of which at least is in the steampunk genre. Is, is it all of it, Mark? No, it's just, I published this in 2021. This is the Colossus of the Thames. This is my yeah. steampunk uh, short stories, but... Yeah. Um, since then, uh, I've been working on a fantasy novel and also having stories published. I've got one coming up in a, a new anthology called British Gothic. And the one I'm going to read from this afternoon uh, is published in this anthology, uh, Bark and Bone, yes. which is available from Space Cat Press. And I will um, I'll post that in the... Uh, in the, in the chat and this features 33 writers or 32 along with me writers on the topic of uh the forest was the was the was the submission call right okay so this story is a i suppose you'd call it a kind of fantasy with slightly kind of dark elements which is about about where i live really as, <laughs> as I can, so. right well take it away maestro <laughs> great so this is as i say the forest king when the Queen of the Moon draws the veil of night over the Green Isle, those under her watchful gaze sit around the fire, eat, talk, play music, and listen to the tales of wandering bards. Tonight is one such moonlit night. On a branch in a tree by the fire, the weary magpie tucks its wings about it and settles in for the story it has heard a hundred times if it has heard it once. The bard coughs to signal that he's about to begin and incants over the fire in a hushed tone. Grel Marvet, Asma Hill. Or at least that is what it always sounds like to the magpie. If the bard fails to speak these words, or if he tells the tale incorrectly, the magpie is charged to fly to the forest king without delay and tell of the transgression and its penance will be done. For it has lived seven lives already and will live seven, seven more and seven again until the man dies. And this is too long for a magpie. While it has become wiser than any magpie who ever lived, a part of it hopes the man will make a mistake so that it may die. This, then, is the bard's tale. There once was a king called Domnal and Broidel, a man as broad as an ox with hair as red as a dragon's tongue. Domnall was a fierce warrior, loved and feared by his people in equal measure. Domnall had a single air, keen, handsome and fair, with eyes that twinkled like a fall of snow. But Keen had something of the dream in him, so Domnall charged his best lieutenant, Porig, to guard the prince and keep him true. I cannot be thy father, Keen complained to Porig one day while the two hunted in the forest. I am not like him. I wish to wander the green isle, not be forever tied to the clan hearth. It was not the, this was not the first time Porig had heard the complaint, but it saddened him, for he had become fond of the young prince and looked forward to serving him in due course as king. You will be king, he said. It's your duty to the clan and your destiny. But Keen responded, my destiny lies elsewhere, my friend. I feel it in my bones. Change is coming, mark me. And Porig felt as cold as the ice which gathers around the loch shore in winter, for he knew not what the prince might mean. One day, not long after, a druid named Finn came to Dom Domnall's kingdom, stealing in at dusk like a spider, as druids will. 
As he and Porrig conducted the wanderer to his father, Keen seemed quite taken with the druid, how confident, calm and wise he was, and this troubled Porrig, though he kept his counsel. Before the king, Finn said, I have travelled this green isle from coast to coast. I ask sanctuary, for that is the compact between druids and kings. Sanctuary is yours, said Domhnall, but I ask in return that you tell us of the world you have seen. Well, that is the compact between kings and druids. So Domhnall welcomed Finn to the clan hall, fed him on mutton, dark bread and honeycomb, and kept his cup full. Imagine travelling the Green Isle and being welcomed by every king, said Keen to Porig. Think how much I would learn. Your imagination could bring, build castles in the fog, said Porig. You've yet much to learn about being your father's heir. The two listened as Finn told Domnall of King Brian and Dove to the north, King Fintan and Faragug to the south, and King Aelil to the west, who was said to be not of this world. Brian's kingdom lay beyond ter terrible mountains, and Fintan's across impassable bogs, but Aelil's were on the other side of the forest, and it was from that direction that Domnall most feared attack. This Aelil troubles me, said Domnall. Cart your omen sticks, druid, and tell me of this fey king. Finn cast the omen sticks. You have nothing to fear, great king, he said. Aelil's kingdom is a simple place of meadow and dappled woodland, a place of peace. He poses no threat. Domnall's face became thunder, but he said nothing. Later that night, while Kean slept, Horrig went to tell the king of how enraptured the prince was by nature and the idea of the wandering life. Domnall listened carefully, then dismissed Porig so he might think. The next morning, the king drew the clan together. I have had a vision, he said. I dreamed that Aelil, shining like the morning sky, strolled through the, stole through the forest with an army of spirits and slaughtered us to the last child. His people were struck with terror and asked what they might do. Domnall looked to the forest. We must build a wall from the mountains to the bog so that Aelil and his army cannot invade and we will take from the forest what we need. Stop, said Finn. Said Finn. You should take nothing more from the forest than, you, than is needed to live. This wall is needed that my clan might live, said Domnall. Men, bring your axes. Father, said Keen, are you sure this is the right course? Shall we not respect the forest which sustains us? The forest should serve our people and not the other way around, said Domnall with ice in his voice. And Porig pulled Keen away. Finn's face became as dark as the night on the loch. If you do this, you will anger the forest king, he said gravely. Forest king, said Domnall. Who is this? He will doubtless aid Aelil in his invasion. We must also vanquish him. To Keen, he said, you, my son, will be at my side, leading our army. Then Domnall looked to Finn, saying, and you will not warn the forest king, druid. Donald ordered Finn imprisoned in a cage of cold iron so that he could not use his powers to free himself. Keen took to his tent and wept. Porig saw the prince's sadness and it saddened him in turn, although he was not sad the druid was being kept away from his charge. For days and weeks the men of the clan toiled with axe and flame, felling trees, hauling away the mighty trunks, cutting off their branches and burning what could not be used. Soon enough, there stood the wall, near as tall as the trees which had made it, with a single gate to be guarded day and night. Domnall held a great feast to celebrate, and at the end of the meal, when the dogs were fed, the king told Keen, Go feed your druid with scraps. Tell him the Green Isle is subject to the might of men, not the conjuring of druids and sprites and forest kings. Keen ordered Porrig to pick up the scraps and a flagon of sour ale, and they headed to where the druid was imprisoned. A magpie was clinging to the bars of the cage, and Porrig saw it for a creature of ill omen. He flung a bone at it, and the bird flew away. Keen looked darkly at his manservant and handed a plate to Finn. The druid ate hungrily, and when he had finished, said, Domhnall is set upon his course, Prince Keen, but you are not your father. I see you on a different path. Then he reached out his hand to Keen, and the prince took it tenderly. Porrig saw this, and a bitter flame grew in his heart. It is too late for me, said Keen. It is not too late, said Finn. Trust me. 
Keen looked into the druid's eyes and said, Very well. Horrid thought to tell the king of what he had seen, but he knew it would enrage him. And when his blood was up, the king was without mercy. So Porrig did not. The very next morning, Donald ordered his men to pick up their axes and spears and shields, armour and helmets too, and to form an army. Father, said Keen, surely the wall is enough for us to defend ourselves against any threat. Donald's eyes blazed with righteous fury and he raised his hand to his son as if to strike him for questioning his father in front of the men. Porrig stepped between them. My king, he said, the prince will do your bidding. Only last night I heard him tell the druid he must obey you. Keen looked angrily at his guardian, but declared loudly, Horrig is right. I will obey, father. The king smiled and seemed mightily satisfied. Follow me, men, he said, his voice as loud as a hammer on an anvil. We will kill the forest king and Ailil, so that our women and children can live in peace. The men clattered their weapons against their shields to make a terrible sound as they marched over the blackened ground they had cleared towards the green wall of trees and the lair of the forest king. As they marched, Keen took Porrig aside and asked, Why did you tell my father I would obey him? Porrig said, That druid will soon depart on his lonely way, but your life is here with those who love you. You will see this in time after our battles are done. As the army left the encampment through the gate in the wall, Horrig looked back and saw the magpie once again at the iron cage, and once again the druid was speaking to it. Then it flew away, and Porrig quietly cursed it, and the druid too. Unbeknownst to him, as they progressed into the forest, the magpie watched the army's every move. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, is this anthology available right now? It is. Yes, it's been it's been published. It's available in, in um, ebook form and also I think in uh, paperback as well. I don't know if they've got any paperbacks left. So, okay. I'll, but I'll post post the link. Yes, fab. Um, that's brilliant. Um, so, um, <coughs> please put your hands together again for Mark Brandon and his story, The Forest King, from the anthology Bark and Bone. Brilliant. Okay. So, Steve, are you feeling a bit more with it now? Yes, I am. I'm sorry about being late. It's just been an absolute... No worries. Amazing. Really no worries. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we're awesome. more, you know, concerned for you, obviously. Thank you. So, uh, are you okay to read? Yes, I am. The, Fabulous. Uh, the story that I'm reading from is yeah. from one of Puck yeah. stories that's in my forthcoming collection. Yeah. Uh, the collection's called Child of Fire and Flame, but the story I'm reading from is uh, called Bloody Shakespeare. I see that <laughs> right. the idea that Puck has been to see uh, Midsummer Night's Dream and is thoroughly unhappy with how he's been represented. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's gone to Stratford upon Avon, Avon to summon the ghost of Shakespeare. Yeah. Okay. Well, that sounds fantastic. So, um, yeah. Um, so please, uh, if you aren't unmuted, please unmute yourselves now, and um, let's welcome back into the spotlight <laughs> SG Mulholland, and uh, it's not the tales of Robin Goodfellow, is it? The Child of Fire and Flame. Child of Fire and Flame. Fabulous. Thank you. Wonderful. Shakespeare's oh, resting place was right at the back of the church, towards the pulpit and what Puck assumed was some kind of sacrificial altar. He only had a passing knowledge of Christianity. What little he had read about had shown him that it was a religion made up of double standards. He had nothing against the religion or the people who practiced it. It seemed to Puck that for a religion that preached peace and love, there was an awful lot of killing of bloodshed. His heavy boots could be heard with each step in the church as it echoed from wall to ceiling to fall and to floor and round again. It made him feel awkward. 
This was, after all, supposed to be a secret undertaking, and if anyone heard it, it would be game over. A second set of footsteps emerged from somewhere in the church. He couldn't tell where it was coming from. The sudden emergency of the moment froze him in his footsteps. The only cover was behind the pews. He was about to take a dive out of sight when the priest came round the corner and caught sight of him immediately. Dressed entirely in black, except for a white collar and grey hair and beard, he was plainly such a kind man even at sight. Staring at Puck with incredulity, shock and awe, for a moment the two of them looked at each other, neither not knowing what to do. The sudden shock of seeing another person in quiet, solitary confinements of the church was as confusing to the father as it was to Puck, and more than a little unexpected. Father. It is father, isn't it? Puck asked awkwardly. The priest nodded, his whole body stock still as Puck crept over to him, his arms spread out wide in a submissive manner. Father. I know the sight of a scrawny fay like me inside your church must be quite a surprise, but I assure you that my intentions are entirely honourable. I believe you, my son. If I may ask, what brings you here? The priest asked. I need to converse. Someone who owns me owes me a damned explanation. Ah, well, the Lord listens to us all, my son. The priest intoned with a knowing smile on his face. He knows all things that have been and will be. His plan is exacted according to his will. Trust me, my son, you are never far from his thoughts. I better not be. The bugger made a mockery, mockery of me, Puck said, drawing closer to the priest, who also held his arms open. The priest looked at him with confusion, unsure what it was he was talking about. I'm not sure we're talking about the same thing, my son, the priest said. I know who we're talking about, and it's not the same person, Puck said, a regretful look on his face. What came next was a shock to both the priest, and if Puck was being honest, even himself. His fist collided with the priest's face with a quick and sudden force that dropped him with an unsuspecting thud to the ground. Puck had to admit he felt somewhat guilty about that. He might not have been a Christian, but even so, respect for the religious had to be had to be paid. Lifting the prone Christian off the cold floor, he seated him on one of the pews, propping him up so he was comfortable. Once the father was comfortable, he finally set about his business. Pulling the pouch from his pocket, he yanked on the drawstrings and looked at the contents. Bone dust. Very fine and very rare. But it was the best stuff to use if you were looking to raise a spirit and contain it. It had been a long time since he had raised the soul from the bleak oblivion of death, but he hadn't forgotten how to do it. Standing over Shakespeare's grave, he poured the contents of the pouch around the, around the, uh, the grave itself until it was on a marble, all on the marble floor, sorry. Reaching out with his hand, he closed his eyes and felt out into the worlds beyond life. The energy in the church was strong, powerful and old. The building itself was soaked in necrotic energy, the kind that seeps from the body once dead. Remnants of the soul left traces in buildings like this, and Puck could feel it at a touch. There was something in the earth, just at the edge of his fingertips. He could feel it tickling his fingernails as he tried to reach out from the beyond. Pushing his fingers through the barrier, he could feel the electric touch of a spirit's form trying to reach out and buzzing along the palm of his hand. There you are, you bastard, he whispered. The buzzing was growing sharper and harder as the spirit reached out with greater effort, trying its best to peel back the veil of death and back into the world of the living. Puck pushed harder into the veil, further and further, 
his arm buzzing with fire, fiery electricity that felt like fire and power mixed in one. He continued to reach out until he finally felt something hard grip onto him. Then he pulled back with all of his might until he fell back onto the floor. His arm was scorched with the same powder that lay on the floor. Parts of the, bo parts of the body always followed into the afterworld. Only slight parts of molecules, but still a fine layer of dust formed itself over his uh, jacket arm. The bone dust had turned from pale white to silver and glowed like fresh snow in the moonlight right on the floor, forming a fine half circle as a ghostly figure hovered above the gra grave. Oi, Shakespeare, down here, Puck his from the floor. The ghost of the bard looked down at him, his eyes aglow like two lamps of blue in the night. He looked confused, unsure. Where was he? Or where was he supposed to be? He had no idea. He was displaced and out of joint. Who there, good sir? Hath you summoned me? Shakespeare asked, his voice echoing ethereally. Too fucking right I have. You and me, we have something to talk about, Puck growled. Well, what is it that I can help you with? Perhaps you wish to ask me about my work. Has my greatness lived on since my death? Puck scrambled to his feet, brushing himself down and spitting on the floor just because he felt like it. Angrier than he had ever felt. Well, not quite. There have been times before this, but he was damn close. He even felt like strangling the bard, if the bard himself had form, but he had no way of accomplishing that feat. You poncy playwriting, poetry spouting git, Puck shouted. You wrote me into one of your damnable crap plays, and I want to know who the hell told you about me. Shakespeare was clearly not used to this kind of reception, either in the land of the living or the dead. He had been something of a celebrity back in his old life, so being spoke, spoken down to like a slack in the streets took some surprise. William was struggling to understand Puck's ire. Though the contentious insults happened to affect him, he was more confused than insulted. Your piece of shit play, A Midsummer Night's Dream, is the biggest load of tosh I've ever sat through. And I've watched Kit Mutt not only did you represent my ancestors and completely degrade them in a pair of bickering gits, but you threw my name in the fucking play as well, he screamed before drawing fresh breath again. My friend, are you saying you didn't like one of my plays, Shakespeare asked? Yes, it was cat. They dressed me up to look like a bloody cherub. And if you ever had to deal with one of those guys, you'd know that's a bloody insult, Puck finished. Shakespeare regarded him with a curious look, not quite understanding what it was that was bothering Puck so badly. May I ask, who are you, sir? Shakespeare asked, his fingers twitching nervously, afraid this creature that had summoned him from their slumber and was even now berating him in his life's work. I am the Red Wolf, the Widowmaker, the Man Killer, the Prince of the Fey Realms, he who is called Robin Goodfellow, but also is called Puck. And you, sir, have made a mockery of me. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> okay. So will you uh let let let's hear it again for um can you repeat what it was called again? I could because I can't remember. And Bloody uh, uh the, the story is called Bloody Shakespeare. Bloody Shakespeare, right, brilliant. Okay. Now you may have gathered that my son tried to phone me while in the middle of that. I'm really sorry about that. So um, he might be doing a bit of editing. <laughs> sorry about that. But, um, yeah. I'm, I'm, you didn't hear any of that, did you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. Sorry. 
Uh, okay. my, my um my mute was off. Uh, it's okay. My my phone went off as well, so it's okay. Oh, did it? Oh, well, yours didn't. Um, yours no, it didn't went off. It went off earlier, but you know. All oh, right. Okay. You know, it was yeah. Great, but, but, yeah, you know, it's it's it really throws you when that happens, doesn't it? Yeah. Really. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. Okay. Um. Well, I I I did really enjoy um that very much actually. Yeah. Thank so. you. That was very good. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to read this. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Well, I'll happily send it to you. Alan. Okay. Well, you're on for that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so right. that was fabulous anyway. So um, you, uh, am I correct in, I think you said last time that the book's published, but you haven't sorted out distribution for it yet. No, that was my first book. This is my second book. Ah, this is the second one. Okay. Yeah, I kind of thought you were book. reading from the set from, from the first one again. No, I was going to put this one in because I'd written a lot of like short stories and novelettes and novellas, but I had to sort of cut it down. So this one I had to go into the second book. Um, okay. so but I'll happily send you the manuscript to you. Right. You're on for that then. <laughs> okay. um, I, you. I, I actually think, you know, it looked to me like there were other people that were enjoying it as well. So, well, anybody who wants to read it happily, I'll send it to you. Okay. Um, so, um, now everything is uh, a bit out of kilter here. So, um, right. I'm, I'm afraid it's come to that time where I've got to finish things off. So um, I'm going to go um, back to the Zardoth Imperative clanship uh, as the Zardothi try to release their clanship, the Bakel, from Voth and PI control. And this is from Chapter 10, The Battle for the Bakel. Uh, before we start, I will tell you that Vudaki means warriors in Zardothi. And um, in this uh, first section, uh, the Zardothi, led by Omol, who was in Discovery um, earlier, um, are, uh, they are aboard the Bakel to liberate it from the Voth. Right, let's see if I can get myself comfortable first. Yeah. Okay. Gerard took his team off in one direction while Omol directed his along the corridor towards the nearest quick shift. Take the control room and you own the ship, he thought. The Bakel was deserted. There were no signs of dismantlement. Several times they stopped to disable cameras, the last inside the quick ship. That's kind of like a lift, you know. Um, we'll give them a nice surprise, Omol murmured. Wren, Farrell and the other Vudaki, men and women alike, met this remark with broad grins. The quick shift took them up to the control room deck. They disembarked and headed towards their destination. They met no Kiai or Voth in the corridors. They're all in there, Beb Jerda said, and jerked a thumb towards the control room. The corridor curved like a convex lens, which precluded the use of suit radios and even hand signals. How are we doing this? Wren asked. One group at each entrance to bottle them up inside the control room until the firefight's over. But if in some, uh, uh, if some in each group aim for any Voth, someone's bound to get them and any others. Um, once they're gone, the Kiai might be happy to join us. And if necessary, I can use this. Omol showed them the stun weapon thrust into his belt. Be aware that if the Kiai are stripping the control room, there'll be cables and components all over the floor, so watch out in there. The others signalled their comprehension with the palm rays. Cameras in this last stretch? Beb nodded. By the other door. I'll take it out. Ready? They all gave the palm rays again. Beb, take half the group to the other door. Meanwhile, Omol had spread his team out between the two groups. He beckoned to them and spaced them out along the corridor, close enough to relay the message once he disconnected the final camera. The signal came down the line. Omol's group 
um, clustered either side of the door, flattened against the bulkhead. Ready? Count of three. He raised his hand and uncurled one, two, three fingers. The message went back down the line. At the precise same thousandth, Beb and Wren laid their palms on the door entry panel. Both doors slid back. Nine disruptors lo locked onto their target. The solitary Voth vanished as the blue flame flashed out across the control room. The rest of the two groups were ready with their weapons. Survivors, your Voth controller is dead. We're, it, we're here to rescue you, Omar shouted. No reply. The disruptor bolts kept coming at them. Omol knelt to bolt, bolt, sorry, Omol knelt to bounce a stun bolt into the control room. Although the weapon was unfamiliar, it might prove a useful addition to the Zardothi repertoire, but he wasn't sure whether he'd need to fire at each ki to knock them out. He aimed at the nearest. The bolt flickered across the room to its target. He toppled to the metal floor. The trooper beside him stepped back, startled by the weapon's effect. Omol took the chance to fire at him as well. The Kiai joined his colleague on the floor. There were no signs of dismantlement in here either. He cast a glance around the control room. The 10 or 12 Kiai in there included dead or in and injured. Two were unhurt but cowered on the floor, hands locked together over their heads to protect them. Beb's group had taken several out already but some shot back. Omol ducked be back behind the door as Wren leaned out to aim an at another Kiai, then straightened and stepped back under cover. The flash of disruptor fire burst through the doorway time and time again. The ship will need repairs. Omol reached in and fired again. His stun bolt met its target. Another bolt floored, sorry, floored a Kiai who took aim at Wren. On the other side of the room, Omol spotted that a Kiai knelt to fire at Beb and flung another bolt at him. As the Kiai um, fell, he fired as if by reflex. The charge gouged a gash in the corridor bulkhead despite its wide angle setting. He thought he'd saved Beb until he saw him hit the floor, cradling his arm. No time to check him, he thought. The last three Kiai were grouped behind a console. They broke cover fired and ducked back down again in turn. Omol targeted each one of them one by one. One subsided onto the floor before he could hit him, taking a shot from a Zardothi disruptor. One for you, Beb, Omol thought. He got the next man with a stun bolt. And as he hit the last Kiai, he felt an instant's relief that it was all over, then realised that perhaps it wasn't. Jazanya, Amrak, Terrell, Make contact with the other team and let me know if they've succeeded at the engine room. The three Vodaki gave him the palm raise and left. Wren, tie up survivors and jettison any bodies into space. Then take your unit to search the ship. Kill any Voth you find. We'll give Beb first aid and take control of the ship. He glanced around the control room. Against the control consoles, there were no boxes with alien script on that contained the stealth equipment. It doesn't look like the humans got round to installing their stealth kit in here after all, it murmured. There might have been good reasons for that. The humans probably realised that Aya and the other children would want to take the ship back at some point, Wren suggested. I'm sure you're right, Omal agreed, but it would be useful to have it here. When we know the ship is Voth free and the Kiai survivors are all imprisoned, we could rig something up or get one of the kits from Red. He crossed to Beb, who had passed out. The disruptor had seared off and cauterized his hand and wrist, but there's no chance of regeneration from that stump. Con he thought, contact Aftar and ask him to send a medic to the sick bay, he ordered uh, and knelt beside him. Beb stirred and within thousands was conscious again, did you notice, he croaked, the Kiai hadn't started to dismantle the ship. That can only mean one thing then, Omal said. They didn't intend to copy the drive. They were going to steal the Bakel. Just as well they didn't put the stealth kit in then, Wren said. 
if it had been there or they'd found it, the Kiai could have stolen the ship and masqueraded as one of ours. Later, after the protest in Duras labor camp, following the distribution of evening rations, oh, Julie Harkness flinched as flying debris struck her arm. She tried to pull Lucy closer for protection. Her arm no longer functioned. Eddie flung his own arm across both of them in a futile gesture of protection. What happened, Julie? Julie shook her head. Something hit my arm. It hurts and I can't move it. Hell, wait a minute. He wriggled round to see better, but still protect them with his own body. Another strike pierced the darkness. In the accompanying strobe flash, he saw that her arm lay along her side with a bend where there shouldn't be one. Julie, I think your arm's broken. Just try to stay still. <laughs> Mummy, Ed, <laughs> Daddy, Lucy sobbed. This cadge? Oh, over there with his real mum, Julie gritted out as she tried to point to them in the group. They'll be fine. Ow! What's going to happen to us, Daddy? Eddie could only shake his head. I don't know, sweetheart. I just don't know. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Right. Um, okay. So, um, yeah. So this brings the spring season to an end, but I hope all of you fab listeners enjoyed all of that. And many thanks to all our lovely authors and readers, that's Steve, Marise, Debbie, Dave and Mark for joining me. Um, and thank you so much to our lovely friends and family studio audience, if we have any for joining us and supporting our readers today um we, we normally have um like a, a chat with the authors after we finish so anybody who is here is most welcome to join that that part will not be recorded or streamed so if you put your video off or anything if there's anybody in the audience tonight um uh you can safely put it back on once i stop the stream and video recording Authors, if you haven't yet done so, here's a reminder to please include links to your books in the chat or send the information to me afterwards and I'll post them on my timeline in the finger on the pulse on my LinkedIn, on my YouTube channel, Helen Claire Gould, and on my website, www.zarduth.com. Do include prices, ISBNs or ASINs, stockists, national, international and local and your websites too. This has been Helen Claire Gould, comparing Fiction Fix Online and bringing to your attention both new and established writers in various fiction genres. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, authors, um, I don't think we've got anybody in the studio audience this time, actually. Um, uh, anyway, um, we do stay with us um, if you are able to after um, I end the stream and the recording. So this is the last meeting in this spring season of Fiction Fix Online. And, but the next Fiction Fix Online is on Sunday, the 8th of September at the start of the autumn season. So please join me on that day at 5 p.m. in the finger on the pulse for the live stream or on my YouTube channel, Ellen Claire Gould, for the Zoom video a day or two later. No slots are yet filled for the autumn season meeting. So if you're an author in any genre, published or unpublished, and you'd like to read then, do get in touch on Facebook, LinkedIn or Goodreads messaging or by email to ask for a slot either on the 8th of September, the 13th of October or the 17th of November. I had to um, put that, uh, go around Novacon to put that in. So, um, so bye till then and thank you so much. Right.